Welcome to another CEO slash co-founder wisdom podcast. Uh, we have Carol Robin with us. She is co-founder at Leaders in Tech. She's also author of an award-winning book. That book is called Connect, Building Exceptional Relationships with Family, Friends, and Colleagues. So we're going to talk about that today. This podcast is brought to you by podpire.com. If you want to start scale, be invited to podcasts like this one or find sponsors. I can help you do that podbuyer.com. Carol, welcome to the pod. Can you briefly tell us about yourself, Leaders in Text, and the book? Sure. Well, first of all, thank you very much for having me on. Um, I am always grateful for any opportunity I have to let people know that this resource exists. So um, before founding Leaders in Tech, before writing a book, I spent several decades at the Stanford Graduate School of Business teaching a course called Interpersonal Dynamics, affectionately known by the students as touchy-feely, emphasis on the feely, as in feelings, not on the touchy. Um, and the, uh, the premise of the course is that being interpersonally effective, i.e. knowing how to develop strong, robust relationships, is a determinant of professional success, that's why it's taught at the Stanford Business School, and also personal success. So it was the most popular course uh, at the Stanford Business School for many decades. I did not invent it. I stand on the shoulders of many people who came before me, but I was there for quite a while and I became known as the queen of touchy-feely. And uh, eventually was approached by Penguin Random House uh, with my co-author, who's actually the father of touchy-feely. And they said, how come this course that thousands of students for decades have said was worth the entire price of tuition uh, doesn't have a book. And we said, because you don't learn about it by reading about it. You learn about how to be effective in creating relationships by creating relationships. <laughs> so then uh, he said, well, what about the people that aren't lucky and privileged enough to get into the Stanford Business School? So then we decided to write the book. I left Stanford in 2017 and founded Leaders in Tech. Um, and Leaders in Tech essentially, uh, Leaders in Tech is the Carol Robin curriculum because in addition to touchy feely, I taught high performance leadership. I taught leadership coaching and mentoring. I, I taught a lot of classes. And I had one of my co-founders who had been a client of mine, uh, Joe Greenstein, in fact, had founded uh, a Flickster and then uh, he bought Rotten Tomatoes and he had a big exit, a big exit to Warner Brothers. And he came to me in 2012, I, say, I think, and said, Carol, why don't you leave Stanford? Why don't we start uh, uh, a nonprofit that brings everything you teach at Stanford to, to the Valley, to Silicon Valley founders who need this so badly? And I said, no, no, I love my students. I'm not leaving Stanford. And he came to me being the exceptional entrepreneur that he is. He came to me every six months until he talked me into it. So in 2017, I left Stanford. We started Leaders in Tech. And uh, it's been successful beyond my wildest dreams. We just launched our seventh cohort of fellows. We just tripled the size of our cohort. Uh, and, um, and, you know, honestly, Charles, I, I believe I, I was, I believe I was put on this planet to help people learn how to, how to connect, how to develop relationships that aren't just contact and no connection that aren't meaningless. And by the way, why is this course so popular at Stanford business school? Because people do business with people. They don't do business with ideas or strategies, or, or machines, or even money. They do business with people, so you better get the people part right. Makes me think of uh, Brian Armstrong, uh, the documentary Coin, I believe it's called, and it's like Brian being coached by Matt Mulcahy yeah. and getting in touch with his feelings to be a better leader. Because mm -hmm. it feels that most of the best founders out there are very much IQ oriented. Yes. And if we look at Elon Musk, the, listening to the audiobook right now, it's incredibly good. I'm also listening to a more controversial character that is definitely on the spectrum as well, uh, Sam Bankman-Fried, 
Yep. I, I still think that Sam didn't have bad intentions. And if there wouldn't have been this attack on the, the company, he would still be uh, well and alive and um, the probably one of the richest men in the world. And Sam happens to be incredibly high on IQ and very low on EQ as well. So what do you have? Well, I mean, it's, the question is not necessarily it is IQ or EQ make better companies or leaders. I think EQ is also complementary, which is why Brian Armstrong, for example, uh, seeks out help on that level. Yeah. But am I right in saying that that uh, you know you can max out uh, profits and revenues by also uh, investing more in your EQ, or should most folks that want to get rich and hopefully get give that back to the rest of the world? go all in on IQ, such as Elon Musk? Well, I think, I think mm -hmm. I, I don't tend to land in places with, with answers that are easily one or the other. Uh, I think it's a lot more complicated than that. Uh, so for starters, you know, Ray Dalio, who, who endorsed our book, you know, speaks to this in his endorsement about how important EQ is. You can't, you can't get there with just IQ. You also can't get there with just EQ, by the way. Um, and, uh, and it, but it depends on what there is. If you want to build a sustainable organization, one that will outlast you, one that will continue to contribute whatever it is that you decided to build the organization for, beyond you, you're, I do not believe you can get there with only uh, IQ. Um, I do think that there are a lot of people and you have named some and you could name, we could name 10 right now who've become enormously wealthy because they were in the right place at the right time with the right product. And that's all it took. And sometimes that is all it takes. So it depends on what do you want? But you know, I will I will tell you, Charles, that I am, I believe all those CEO founders who sign up and 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 become members of the leaders of tech community, they do that because they believe they can't build the kind of organization they want to build without really paying attention to the EQ. Furthermore, I am. I get a lot of emails and texts, uh, that, uh, predictably from former MBAs, saying, I just became a CEO, I owe it all to you. I just raised my third fund, I owe it all to you. We'd expect that. But you know the ones I'm proudest of? Which one? I'm pretty sure your class just saved my marriage. I mm -hmm. just reconciled my relationship with my brother, who I hadn't talked to for three years. Be you know, Thank you for teaching me what you, now I get. Well, well, thank you for finally writing a book because my co-founder never went to Stanford, never learned this. We just sat down and read this book together and it's made a huge difference. So, and it is not easy. It's not three easy steps to better relationships. Human beings are much more complicated than that. It doesn't work that way. And unless you're willing to invest the time and the energy and the effort, uh, then, and, and understand that's what it's gonna take, um, then you can't just kind of say, yeah, yeah, I know relationships matter, but I, I, I don't have any time to read that book or I don't have any time to go to Leaders of Tech or yeah, I got, I got other things I need to spend my money on. Well, okay, then you gotta decide what's important. Right. Thank you for that. That's um, yeah, that's helpful. The thesis being that as a leader, you uh, or the types of leader you deal with, you had you got funded and then you started investing and betting this money on humans. So let's say that you invest a uh, hundred k in one human, that human can bring a million back. So exactly. if you increase your EQ with them, you should be able to increase the output, uh, their output that is, and do that at scale. The question yeah, I have, Charles, yeah. let me say this. So what I taught was leadership. So let's talk for a moment about what is leadership. How do you inspire people, motivate people, bring out the best in people so they will give you their very best in the absence of any relationship or connection? 
vision. So in the case of Musk, for example, if you recruit super nerds that want to get to Mars, well, you remind them of that big vision. Correct. And sometimes that's enough. And sometimes it's enough to get them in the door. Sometimes it's enough to keep them there for a while until they start feeling taken advantage of, unimportant, uh, not in any way um, appreciated. Um, or uh, in the case of a lot of people in science and engineering, respect is a huge value for them. Uh, and if they've, you know, so all you need to do with people like that is, is have them feel rightly or wrongly that they're completely replaceable. And there are a hundred people waiting in line for the privilege of working with you. You're not going to get the best out of those people. Because that was my exact next question, you know, because when you work at a Tesla or a SpaceX, for example, yep. your performances are your badge of honor and that's the culture if you don't perform you need to get out of the way is is performing just enough um it is my question for you because these guys after or these gals after the launch you know they chill they have a beer and uh, they nerd out about engineering stuff so I, I did that so every human needs to be loved in the end and, and shown some heart in some shape or some form but if we view it as a pack they're them hunting and bringing back that meat to the fire is I contributed to that piece of the rocket. I did what I was told. And is that usually enough to keep them in the org, just pure accomplishment and getting the task at hand done? Or are there other forms of cohesion in engineering type of people? Well, so so I, I'm always reluctant to answer a question like that with unanswer because there's too many different kinds of people with too many different needs. So um, it might be enough for some. It might be enough for some at one point in time, and then it ceases to be enough. Um, it might be uh, enough if the person believes that it's a stepping stone to something else that they care about until the stepping stone isn't there. There's a right. lot of different reasons that people, um, so first people need to feel they matter. They need to believe that what they're doing, their contribution isn't li some little cog in a wheel that nobody's ever going to see and doesn't matter. Um, now in the case of artists and in the case of, we can think of some people in particularly, I think of software engineers as artists, they don't care whether anybody ever sees their creation. The very act of creation was meaningful enough. And uh, and that's great if you have, but you know what it's about, Charles, is fit. If you have a person who's, that's all they need and want, and that's what feeds them, and that's what you need from them, and you ask of them, and they, you know, the person ends up in that situation, in that uh job doing that work well great and you better have a bigger repertoire to offer than that right it's a very complex question um me how i view it is that the company hires for output and they need roi on every single employees and these employees might have ups and downs like every humans right so if they don't perform at some time the question as a leader is can i turn that around or can i predict that they will come back and perform because the common de denominator as a company is making profits right and and accomplishing the goals that is if it's yeah a, a for profit right if it's a non-profit that entire different leap uh, ballpark, although they do have KPIs to... Yeah, I got news for you. We're nonprofit leaders in tech and we're all about performance also. There you go. Yeah. To measure it differently. Okay. Yes, <laughs> yes, exactly. So yeah, it is a complex uh, question. I want to ask though, you do a bunch of retreats with top people. I've, I've seen the folks that have been at your retreats and it's really impressive. Um, Thank you. What have you learned from these founders? What challenges do they have and what struggles do they come with at the retreats and how do you help them resolve that? So 
the some of the biggest challenges that they that that our founders have are that they understand how important the people part of the business is. They believe it. It's not like they don't end up at our door if they think that's all BS and it only and the only thing that matters is IQ. Okay. Those are not the people who end up with at our at our retreats. So they know it matters. They don't quite know how to develop it. They don't know how to get better at it. They know that they want to build a, a, a culture where people want to do their best, but they don't necessarily know how. They understand some aspects of leadership, but not others. The other thing that uh is probably not surprising is that the vast majority of the CEO founders who end up coming through our doors are incredibly lonely and have nobody in their lives. Sometimes they have a coach, but even then, um, they don't have anybody else in their life who really understand what they're going through who really emp who, who empathize with what they're going through. They, 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 I've had CEO founders say, the minute I step out the door every morning, I have to put on a suit of armor. I cannot allow anybody to know what's really happening for me. And in the house, I can't either because my spouse, my spouse is going to freak out if I tell my spouse that I'm more, or my significant other or, or whatever. So they're lonely. And they lose a lot of perspective because they have nobody, they have no sanity checks with regard to how they're seeing things because they're all alone. So one of the things they they that's incredibly valuable for them at Leaders in Tech is that they all find each other. And now they have a community of CEO founders. By the way, by definition, you cannot join our program if you are post-IPO. So you have to be pre-IPO. And uh, I can tell you why we chose that in a bit, yeah, but that's my pre question. pre-IPO, but you have to have at least raised a substantial seed round because we, we have very limited, you know, we had 1,400 nominees for our last cohort of fellows. We took 72. So uh, it's exceedingly competitive. And if we're going to invest in, and we don't, we're not, we're a nonprofit, so we're not in this to make money, but we're investing our very limited resources in the, these founders because we're trying to create a better world. And we're not going to do that with a founder who hasn't even been able to raise any money. <laughs> uh, so see, you know, preferably a round pre-IPO. Why pre-IPO? Once you've IPO'd, your organization, it's like a ship that has sailed. It's way down the, down the path already. And turning a big tanker truck out in the middle of the ocean halfway to its destination is a whole lot harder than working on you when you're just leaving shore. Right. Yeah. And <clears throat> I mean, funding that. We could argue for a while, but yeah, I'm not going to raise, well, I don't have any plans to raise fund and I still think I'm going to be a, a trillionaire uh, with everything that's happening, but that's another uh, conversation. Yeah. Um, it's okay. So CEO loneliness, I call it founder loneliness. I run masterminds on my end and yeah, it's the title of multiple campaigns that I run. And I think that's the number one pain. Um once people read these words, it, it clicks instantly yep. in their brain. They, they even forget that they're lonely. Some people are just comfortable in loneliness. Uh, they, you know, they thrive in silence and being alone and they don't suffer from loneliness. But I do think that a lot of these CEOs or founders would be better off like talking to people and, and peers. Um, the I mean, question, even, even yeah. if they're very introverted. It's, so it's not about needing a lot of exchange. So there's extroverts who need a lot of exchange with people. But, lo, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, the Surgeon General's book called about the loneliness epidemic. Somewhat uh, familiar. Uh, it's called Together. The book is called Together. And it's about an epidemic of loneliness. 
that is happening in this, in, in at least in this country and has been happening and for a while. And it's behind a lot of the serious social issues and problems that we're all having as a nation. And by the way, COVID did not help. COVID was devastating for the world, not the disease. Well, the disease was, but... Yeah, but for all the social fabric. Yeah, that will kill way more people. Uh, I mean, we're already seeing it with these terrorist events. That I mean, yeah. it's not fully caused by that, but, you know, people, when they get isolated and separated, um, they tend to believe that the others are different. And yep. yeah, that yep. I mean, that's how society was formed, cohesion, and that's how we grew. So... The, the question is, so they come during these retreats and these coaching programs, they meet new people. Um, what change do you see in them after they're released back into their companies? Uh, do they go more after uh, relationships and taking time and more touching more on the EQ side of things? What precise changes do you see in them after uh, they have gone through a program? So the first thing that happens is in business, we are, and, and boy, did this happen during the pandemic and once we all went online, task get, gets very, very foregrounded and relationships get backgrounded. One of the things that happens for these folks is that they at least bring relationships to be, it's not that tasks are no longer important, but the relationships come to be, uh, come to be held with equal importance to task. Uh, so what they're, and, and what does that translate into? That translates into much stronger executive teams. So our CEO founders send some of their team members through four day retreats that we do that isn't part of the fellows program because they want their executive team to speak the same language, to have the same skills. And now those teams feel unstoppable. They are infinitely stronger than they were before they had the, it's, it's about tools and competencies and skills. It's not woo woo. And it's also not, um, uh, it's not magic and it's a learn, it's learnable. And you know what? It comes more easily to some people than others. Right. <clears throat> then all of these founders, what have you learned from them? Because um, yeah, it's always vice versa. And you teach and you learn at the same time. Yes, yes. Why have they got where they were today? I mean, it's a complex question again, but what top five skills do they usually nurture about apart from EQ? Well, for starters, they have unequivocal belief in what they're doing and its importance. They are mission driven. They are the definite. If you look up mission driven in the dictionary, you'll see pictures of all of them. Okay. Um, so, uh, and you know, I was never a founder. People at Stanford used to call me an intrapreneur uh, because I wasn't, you know, uh, because I started a lot of things there, but I did not start a company until Leaders in Tech. Uh, but one of the things that I, I saw myself in, in all the founders that come to leaders in tech is a, a, an, an unshakable belief in the importance of what we're doing in their case, what they're doing and why they're doing it. That's the first. The second is, um, a, the, the capacity to, de to develop great resilience, and by the way, we don't develop resilience by having everything always work out. <laughs> it's only when things don't work out and you figure out what to do about it and you come back that you even realize you're resilient. So there's a relationship with failure that's different. Uh, in fact, no student ever took a class from me, nor any executive ever coached by me, nor every participant in Leaders Tech, in Leaders in Tech not heard me say, it's a fog, another fucking opportunity for growth. Every time it doesn't go the way you want it. My long COVID, one of the biggest a fogs I've ever had. And if you can 
and I think that's what what a lot of these actually all of these founders have in common that they view failure, they view mistakes as opportunities to learn. That's the other thing I'll say. They are learners. Good leaders are good learners, and entrepreneurs don't make it unless they're learners. Uh, so, um, and of course, I'm a teacher. So, what a wonderful fit, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, beautiful lessons right there in a fog. I'm definitely gonna steal that from you. And yeah, just my last question is yeah, related on, on fog, which is uh, a yeah. long COVID and the challenge of it. You and I discussed that when we started the pod, it's, uh, it can be a very uh, challenging endeavor. You've been facing that for past 12 plus months. So how are you dealing with that? How does that affect um, your day to day? And what are your goals finishing this year? So for starters, I wrote a piece on LinkedIn. If anybody goes to my LinkedIn profile, Carol Robin LLC, uh, uh, not the leaders in tech profile, just the Carol Robin LLC on LinkedIn. Uh, I wrote a piece on lessons learned from long COVID. Uh, and uh, one of the lessons for, for leaders that, that I want to underscore is if you build an organization that is too reliant on you, you have got a great deal of exposure and you are very vulnerable. Because one of the things I did is built, a, built an organization that had a lot of people so that when I didn't have the capacity to do everything that I'd been doing, it was able not only to continue, it was able to keep growing and get even bigger and more successful. By the way, you know what you need to do if you're gonna be a leader who does that? You're gonna to have to park your ego and decide that the entire organization doesn't have to depend on what on you. And I don't know about you, but I know an awful lot of entrepreneur founders that are very, very successful, whose egos would get in the way of ever allowing for the possibility that they might wanna have people on board that could replace them. So that would be the first thing. The second thing I've learned, and I said this to you earlier, is, is acceptance. Acceptance is not resignation. So I accept that I have much more limited capacity than I did pre-COVID, pre-long COVID. I accept that I have no idea if I'm ever going to get all my energy back. And, uh, and even if I do, I have absolutely no idea when. Uh, and... It doesn't mean I'm just like giving up and saying, oh, well, <laughs> that, that's the end of my life. So the the difference between, and by the way, acceptance, the, uh, the difference is important because resignation, there's the anger and um, that some people get, the energy they get from the anger when they fight something is also depleting. So there is a way and, and this, I, I have my meditation practice to thank for. There is a way to hold a situation with acceptance and possibility and hope and strength that's mm -hmm. different that I, I don't think I ever knew before I had long COVID. Wow. Yeah. <clears throat> if you're going to use anger, use it uh, judiciously, but I would say, yes, micro actions, maybe use it to motivate actions on a short term, but also be very, very patient and do not ever fall in these uh, spirals of negativity in which you get angry at yourself, angry at your body. and yeah, or, even not... ang or even angry at others. I will, I will tell you, Charles, that one of the fundamental uh, lessons that we teach with regard to emotions, you know, students call it touchy feely because of the focus on emotions and feelings as the basis for connection. So I may not ever be angered by what angered you, but I understand anger. So we can connect around the emotion without ha having to connect around whatever caused it. Right. We can co connect around sadness. We can co connect around fear. Those are fundamental. And the other thing we teach is that anger is a distancing emotion, whereas all almost all the others are connecting. Mm. And anger is often a secondary emotion, meaning that underneath the anger, we're actually afraid or we're 
hurt or were sad, but we've been socialized to never talk about those yucky feelings because they're, you know, they're not professional, they're not manly, they're blah, 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 blah. And so what do we do? We lead with anger. That's what we are socialized to do. Wow. And that does not create stronger relationships. It does not create, you know, connection. Huh, that's interesting. Anger as a distancing emotion. Me, I view it more as a fire. And I can apply that fire to burn things. If these things are bad, I can burn them. Um, or if there's or you obstacle. can harden, Or you can harden them if you apply just the right amount of. Yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, it's, yeah. Sometimes can be totally destructive. The fire can catch and uh, I can burn myself. You know, I try to wear gloves, but uh, yeah, it's not an emotion I overuse and that I uh, invite folks to use it. Most of the time it's really de destructive and toxic. Most people don't know how to control that myself included, you know? So um, yeah, a very valuable lessons to date. Uh, thank you for sharing all of that, Carol. Where can uh, people find out more about you? Well, uh, go to connect, www.connectandrelate.com. There you will find all about the book, tons of podcasts, and as well as uh, things written by major media. If you look, click under media, you'll find all kinds of articles and podcasts and that. You can also go to, um, I think, activities and download a free assessment so that you can you know, take the assessment, give it to a couple of, of other people in your life, and then compare how you see yourself to how they see you. And then you might mm. say, oh, maybe I, maybe I'm not as, my EQ isn't as high as I thought it was. Um, totally free. You can download a start your own learning group guide. Uh, the only thing, the only investment you'll have to do, make is every person will need a book or they'll need to share a book. Um, uh, and then of course you can, uh, you, there's a link there, I believe, straight to Leaders in Tech, if you want to know more about the Leaders in Tech program. Thank you so much.